Thanks for joining the Focus Hunting Podcast. For us, hunting in the outdoors isn't just a hobby, it's a lifestyle. Join us as we cover all things hunting, fishing, and the outdoors in Western Canada. Out of this one. The last one, we didn't even get it to any of the good elk stuff. So I know. It's like, you know I'll try to stay on t- I'll try to stay on focus <laughs> this time. No yeah. rabbit holes. No rabbit holes. Yeah. Um, okay. Um, so Mark, thanks for hopping on the show again, buddy. Yeah, man. Good to be back on. Um, so like, like we were talking about, we're going to do a four part mini series. And basically what we're going to do is we're going to dive into your program. First of all, where people can find it, how they get access to it. And then kind of, we're kind of going to work through the modules. And, uh, basically what we want to do is we want to get people looking for elk spots now, not middle of August when it's already, you know, that time you can actually have found, you should have your spot e-scouted maybe if you get a little time you know a, a weekend here or there take the family out do some actual boots on the ground scouting so um obviously you've been on the show lots we don't everybody knows who you are and even if you weren't on the show everybody would know who you are anyway so let's just start with talking about um tree line where we can find it how we get access and then working into the program okay. well thanks for having me on uh i'm I, I always love doing these little mini series because, you know, a lot of these podcasts, a lot of this information gets up there. You get surface level stuff and you don't really get to get into the weeds very much. But so many people message me all the time. And Mark, I, I love the fact that you go into all this detail and sometimes the detail gets long and it gets drawn out, but it's important part of what you're doing. And when you just kind of surface level stuff, I don't think people always get where they want to go. So um, anyway, uh, thanks for the introduction. So, I, last year, I made a consolidation to uh, one platform. I used to have treelinepursuits.com. I used to have some, my llamas were on a different site. So I just redid all of my stuff now is at treelineacademy.net. All the courses are there. The bear tour that we're doing, my llama rental stuff is there. Uh, All my, even my apparel stuff, you know, shop stuff. Everything's under one umbrella now. So it's a lot easier for people to find uh, if they're looking for course information or or podcasts, all the podcasts that I've ever done, including all the focus podcasts, are all there in chronological order with a description so you can kind of search and kind of look through them. Um, I'm trying to make it easy for people to get all the content that we've been working on for, you know, the past three to four years. And so, uh, yeah, you can find everything there. Beauty. Awesome. Mm-hmm. Okay, so now let's talk a little bit about, I'm going to bring the screen up here. So uh, actually, before I bring the screen up, let's talk about um, just membership. So it's a two, you, it's a two year, you, you get in, you have access for two years, right? Right. So and that's funny you said that because what happened originally was the course is over 30 hours and it's 50 modules. So a lot of guys and, and women, let's just be honest, every, let's just people, let's just use the word people. A lot of the people that end up taking my course way underestimate how long it's going to take them to work through it, right? And so um, I don't feel, and uh, I don't feel that you can really grasp, especially if you're a new hunter. You almost have to apply these principles and go out and just do it. And then I think the real benefit is that coming back and going through again. And your second year, like when you've got some experience under your belt, you've got a little bit of backcountry knowledge. Now you're tying in with some of this elk finding information. I think that the aha moment or the people that when people's eyes are really opened is really the second year. And so I hate one year subscriptions. I Well, one, I hate subscriptions anyway, um, but I have to do something. So I set it to two years. And even after that, I got people renewing. I do a 50% renewal. So I, I try to make it where it's really cost effective. For If you need more than two years, then we'll make it happen. <laughs> and I am finding quite a few that want to do after the two years. But two years gives you two full seasons to work through it. So that was an important part of what my original plan was. That I want to give people time to try it out, look through it go on a hunt and then come back and kind of almost do it again at a higher level. If that makes sense. Yeah, definitely does. That's so Um, funny, Mark. That's exactly what I did. I took your course. 
you use all your apps, you start planning a couple of hunts. And then when you get boots on the ground, you start connecting the dots of, okay, this is what I'm actually seeing when I'm looking on my uh, Google earth and I get down that level and I'm actually boots on the ground, that spot, you start to really be able to connect those dots. So by your second year, it's good to go back in, revisit stuff. And it's funny because maybe a lot of people will go straight to the part of identifying elk terrain and then they go back to the more technical stuff, how to put it all together. So it's more seamless. And uh, I, I found that was exactly what I did. I went do the basic stuff and then you go back and you revisit and fine tune stuff. Well, that's what, that's what I'm seeing too. And that's the feedback I've been getting too, is that guys, uh, a lot of, a lot of folks are saying things like, um, you know, I really didn't, it seemed so you went through that pretty quick and I didn't really realize the importance of that yeah. until I actually like the zones of pressure. For example, when people start really analyzing where the pressure is coming from, how the pressure is getting into their hunt area, how to look at trails and how to look at trailheads. A lot of people just, ah, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, then when they, you know, when they find a, a situation where there, there's a lot of people and there's, they start to realize that, Hey, I should have, I should look at that again. And, um, and, and I am. So one of the things I am going to do, guys, is this next year, I've learned so much more about putting this stuff together in a way that can be digested um, that I want to go back and redo some of it to make it a little more in the order that you might want to consider doing it. You can do it any order you want, but I have learned some things and I'm adding some new things. Um some new technologies guys the minute i publish this thing the on x the gaia the is out of date right there's a new feature there's a new this yeah. there's a new that so it's impossible to be perfectly up to date but i am going to go back and remodularize it a little bit and tweak it and and i'll be honest with you improve my video editing skills i get sick and tired of looking at my face when I'm looking at a course, I've got my little face down in the right hand corner. That's going away. Um, <laughs> it's just yeah. like I can't take it. <laughs> and uh, so I've learned a lot over the over the last few years about that, and especially as I work on this new bear course. Um, I'm learning a lot that just how to put it together in a little better in a little better format. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right on. Yeah. Well, I mean, I can't even imagine the work goes into it. Oh yeah. So. so uh, like we were saying, what we want to do is we want to get people looking like working on their e-scouting now, not come middle of August. So, you know, here in British Columbia, we have a spring bear season. A lot of places do. A lot of Western states do. Um, now, while you're, you know, if you're going through and learning all this stuff now in February, spending a bit of time in February or March, when you're out looking for bears, glassing for bears, you can start to take notes of stuff you learned in and just keep mental notes of places where might be conducive to elk come, you know, middle of August when you can actually go put some boots on the ground in different areas when the snowpack is gone. So I really want to get people involved and taking this course and getting them to actually go through the modules right now, rather than, you know, we talk about this stuff in the middle of the summertime and middle of August rolls around mm -hmm. and then it's like, Hey, here you go. So Let's talk about now we know where to find your um we know we know where to find it. Now let's talk about um getting access. So it's a two-year subscription. Now, once we're in, I'm gonna pull up the screen. So I hope you guys can see it. Hopefully, I know what I'm doing here. Um share. You guys see that there? Yep. Okay, so this is really great. So as you can see, I'm uh I've already well, you can see this little 4% complete. We're going to see, yeah, we're going to see exactly what you've been doing, what you haven't been doing. <laughs> no, nobody <laughs> paid attention to that at all, okay? <laughs> so we're in the course right now. Now it's welcome to the course. So now let's just kind of, Mark, walk us through, like you don't have to get into the details, but what I'll do is I'll click on these and we'll kind of just quickly go through. Obviously, we're not going to go through all of them in great detail. We just want to kind of like, Familiar. We'll just hit the highlights. We'll just yeah, hit the exactly. highlights. Yeah. So you and tell so, me where we're walking through and I'll click on them and then we'll go from there. Okay. So before we did that, I wanted to say something about what you just said. So <laughs> in my course sales, this is what's funny because this is so, it's not funny, but it's eye opening. I sell 10 to one courses, 10 to one in August versus any other month of the year. 
And I'm always like cringe when I get to August and all these guys start buying the course. Cause I'm like, you waited too long yeah. to be able to really go through it and prepare a hunt plan and get a custom <laughs> markup set going all the things you can do it. You can do it right. But you're under the gun to, especially if you're a new hunter. Mm -hmm. So I appreciate what you said that now is the time is that you should start working on at the same time you're looking at application strategies and what tags you're going to go for and all that stuff. You should start working on hunt areas. And uh, there's a lot of things you can do initially. That's not a waste of time. You know, when you start looking at pressure, you start looking at core hunt areas, you start looking at, um, at just fly out doing flyover tours, which I'm going to go over tonight. I have a I have a live webinar tonight. I know this is coming out after the fact, but I am going to go over some of the Google Earth stuff tonight, and some of it's related to early identification of hunt areas. So I did want to mention that that my number one month is August, which it should not be. It should be right now in February. Okay, so it's funny. I I, I love looking at your percent there, um, <laughs> Kevin. But I knew, um, I knew your I knew I I had to bring it up because I knew you were going to. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. So the other thing that I could tell, I'm like, I'm like the, I'm like the federal government, right? I'm, I'm like the, um, I'm watching over you guys now. Not really. I do not pay attention, but I can go in there and I can see which modules you're skipping and I can see which ones you're looking at, which ones you're looking at the most. And that's actually what we were just talking about, Derek. I'm going to redo some things based on the statistics that I'm seeing. So the most, like you, most people, like you just mentioned, yeah. they get in here and they start scrolling down through there. Kevin's not even there yet. And you get down <laughs> to where it says elk finding concepts. Okay. Yeah. I want to start there. Find elk. That's 20 modules in yeah. and you're going to start there, which, Hey, there's nothing wrong with it. Right. I, there's, I'm guilty, just... <laughs> guilty, straight to that part. <laughs> but I think you will be surprised that the little tips and things that you'll pick up uh, in a lot of the other modules, you know, I've been chasing out for 30, this will be my 34th year uh, in the West. And I've learned a lot of things and not because I'm good at it. It's because I've made every freaking mistake known to man. And a big part of this course is, is really helping people to not make some of the mistakes that I've made. Um, so uh, anyway, a lot of people do want to skip ahead and skip around and there's nothing wrong with that. And what's great about the course, it does track your percentage of each module. It keeps track of where you're at and it keeps track of where you're at in each video. I do right, guys realize that some of these videos can get, they're an hour long and they're mm -hmm. detailed. And so being able to stop in the middle and come back to the same spot was important. And so it does keep that kind of in track as well. So, you know, right off the bat, you got the welcomes, you got the things. It's got a curriculum overview, gives you kind of what's what's all included. But the most skipped over modules in the course <laughs> are the realities of e-scouting and that understanding limitations. And guys, these are the biggest hunt killers. For guys that get over their head, they plan hunts that are too far from the trailhead for what they're capable of doing, or more importantly, what their partners are capable of doing, um, especially if they're newer hunters and they don't understand the Western terrain, they don't understand the effects of alt altitude. So there's a lot of grounding information in there in those in those couple of modules that help help you kind of set up your whole plan for success. So um you know, but again, people tend to be like, oh, I know, I, I know what I can do. I know what I can't do. I don't need to, to look at that. So again, I just want to throw that out there. The state method research, <laughs> excuse me. There's a lot of information there and a lot of the links there, which actually I've got a couple of broken links that I found just recently that I need to fix. And so in here, we start breaking down the various states, the various links to the various harvest statistics for all the states. I've tried to organize it so it's really easy for you to get to where you want to go to analyze it. I talk a little bit about how I personally do it. Um, now, this is one of the modules that I'm going to redo 
and add a lot of new stuff. I'm going to insert a lot of go hunt stuff. I'm going to insert a lot of other research methods that I use. Um, and there's some, you know, it, it talks about uh, articles, research articles that I've used and that I continue to use. Like, for example, Top Rut. So there you go. That Top Rut is defunct now. You can no longer get that those KML files from that company. But you can get them from me now because I wanted to feel that they're so valuable. That was one of the reasons that I created those those files. But you know, remember this is a this is a four year old program, so I do have a few things in here that I'm going to go back and I'm going to adjust and update. But most of for the most part, though, it's all pretty solid. And then next up, you know, we get into the basic needs of elk, which is a lot of people don't understand what elk eat during certain times of the year. A lot of people think of elk, they think, well, they eat grass. So I need to find just places that, well, that's not true. Um, elk, grass makes up a big portion of their diet. There's no doubt about it. But at certain times of year, they focus on woody plants. They eat a lot of forbs. They they switch grasses. Um, they switch types of grasses depending on if they're uh, wintering versus uh, the season uh, during the rut. Um, and so there's a lot of considerations in the basic needs, uh, as well. And one of the best presenters for basic needs of elk that I've ever heard is Randy Newberg. He spends a lot of time and he's put a lot of work into what elk need during different cycles and different stages of the year. So I've learned a lot from him and mm -hmm. his inspiration and some of his stuff has a lot to do with what I've, what I've done here. So, um, do you guys have any questions on those or you just, just keep kind of going with that? Um, yeah. I mean, for the listeners up in Canada, um, yeah. can, a lot of this stuff though, like the state applications obviously isn't essential to what we're doing up here. Um, right. But everything else is, I mean, elk or elk. So just because right. some of the stuff and you guys are talking about some of the stuff that's in like Montana, Colorado, Utah, I mean, Utah's, you know, these are all bordering States of, of mm -hmm. Canada, British Columbia, Alberta, right? So a lot of this stuff is essential and is, you know, it's contiguous with what's going on up here. Well, as far as the state research, guys, I hope as you're going through this, what you're going to pick up on is not so much, like you said, Kevin, the specifics. It's the process that you need to go through, right? The process is the same. How to look at harvest data, how to do uh, five-year averaging, how to look at um, various research articles on habitat in Canada. You know, there's, I guarantee you, there's been a lot of research done on elk habitat that has the word hunting is not in there one time. Yeah. Right. And mm -hmm. those articles are gold guys. When you can find that level of research, you start to understand elk so much better than you did before you read that article. And so when I talk about research methods and applications and stuff, all that has to be all, I, I want to include all of that. So don't get caught up into, well, I'm not in Montana. I'm not in Colorado. I'm not in, that's fine. But what I want you to get out of this is the process and the methodology that you're going to work through as you identify units, areas, zones, whatever your situation is where you're trying to apply it to, for example, Canada. And it's, it's funny. I, I don't know if it's because of your podcast guys or not, but the numbers of Canadians that are reaching out to me saying, Hey, Google earth and Canada sucks. And how do you get better quality images? And they're always fuzzy and they're always this and that. And, and Alaska too, same. I get the same about Alaska. And, but the numbers of Canadians that are, that are finding um, tree line Academy and, and getting involved is, is really incredible. Uh, I'm getting, I'm getting almost as many questions from Canadians as I am from uh, Americans on it right now. It's really I guess there's a need. There's a there's just not a lot of resources um, that I've been able to uncover, at least for Canadians. Now, I am I working on yeah, toolkits. I I, I'm not familiar, familiar with any of them. So, I mean, that's yeah. why stuff like this is good. And, and like I said, I mean, elk or elk. And, you know, I've killed elk. Like this year, I killed elk in British Columbia and Alberta. I mean, they do the exact same thing regardless where you are, you know. Uh, well, I am working on, too, guys. I, I've gotten such a demand from Canada that, 
I am working on um, GIS tools for Canada. There, it's more complicated for me because I, I can find the data, but I have to understand your system a little better than what I do in order to apply that data. So I'm in the process. I hope by next year, I'm going to have a full set of Google Earth toolkits, just like I have for the for the states. Um, for Canada is my goal. So I'm working on that. Uh, awesome as well. So I might actually be picking your guys' <laughs> brains a little on on that as well when I get to it. You know, historical fires and and stuff like that's pretty simple. But when it comes to hunting units, hunting zones, and and linking all that stuff in, um, that's where um, I'm. I've got to learn learn the system. Mm-hmm. So basic needs of elk. We talked about that. Identifying core hunt areas is the next module kind of in the chain. And what we're really doing there is this is where it gets a little, this is where I want to come back and improve this because it's really difficult to put this in the right order for the things that you should be doing step by step by step. Um, Because, I like to do e-scouting. The way I approach my e-scouting guys is by little bites. And what I mean by that is I try not to sit down and do a whole hunt plan at one session. I think it's a mistake. I think you miss things. You overlook things. You don't see the big picture all the time. I'll work on hunt area A for a little while, and then I'll work on another whole complete different hunt area Then I'll come back and work on a, I find that going back and forth, I just start to pick up on things that I overlooked very easily. And I'm like, Oh, I didn't really notice that you could get into this from over here Um, or from even across the state line, you know, just little things like that that start to make, well, that's obvious. I don't know why I'm, how did I miss that road? How did I miss that way in? Or how did I, not identified this how did i miss this north slope over here and oh that road is closed i thought it was open all those things it's hard to get all of that done with one pass does that make sense and i think that the more you come back and and revisit your hunt plans and your strategy the better they get now in order to do that you have to have a pretty good documentation system or a journaling or notes and your your, the way you're marking up the custom icons and the custom colors and all the things that I've talked about a million times on a lot of podcasts all these things have to be working and have to be you know they have to be firing on all cylinders for it to really make sense and work for you so you know I like the way you're scrolling through so you can you can kind of when I'm looking for core hunt areas what I'm looking for is areas that I want to consider for hunting spots, right? These are not, maybe they're going to make the cut. Maybe they won't, but like, let's just say, for example, if I'm going to Montana and I'm going to be hunting for a couple weeks, I'm going to have, when I, when I leave for my hunt, I want to have three to five hunt areas ready to go. Mm -hmm. But that might mean guys that I start with 10. I might have 10 outlines and so what I like to use, the tool I like to use, um, I don't want to get too much in the weeds here, is I like to use the polygon tool. I drop a quick area polygon around any place I'm interested in, and I make a few notes about it, and I move on. And, man, I that technique has, has really helped me to identify some really prime spots. And if I find that I'm not interested in it or it doesn't work, I just delete them. But I will put those polygons around any real quickly around any area that I'm considering, make a few notes, and then move on. So when I'm talking about identifying core hunting areas, I'm really initially looking to label or identify areas that I need to come back to that or I want to fully vet and I want to break out a little more. I want to vet them more. I want to, I want to really start to dig in to these areas to see where they are going to end up on my list of five. So one last thing I'll say about that, guys, is I work really hard not to have a number one hunt area, especially at this time of year. It's hard not to do, guys. You you find this spot, you're like, oh, this is this is the mother load. This is my this is my A, this is on my A list. And you 
spend so much time on that one and you really neglect your other four, right? And when it comes time and you get into the mountains and you get in there and you're like, oh, this isn't as good as I thought it was going to be. Well, your B, C, D, and E are not really fully vetted mm -hmm. because you put all of your eggs in one basket or, you know, most of them. And so I work real hard not to have a preconceived idea of what my number one, two, three, four, five hunt area is until I get through the whole process. And I am shocked at how many times that number four that I thought was, oh man, this is a, this is a Hail Mary spot. This is a Hail Mary backup spot. Once I really looked at it and really, it ended up being my number one spot. Mm -hmm. But so I hope you guys are picking up on that, that I try not to get too tunnel visioned on your prime spot versus um, a backup spot, at least at this point in, in the process. Yeah, I, I know. So when I first met you, that's one thing we talked about. And that's one thing I always felt like I was doing was putting too much emphasis on one spot. And I mean, mm -hmm. you and I have known each other for what, like three years now. And, and in three yeah. years, I've killed four elk. So I mean, all these things that we've been talking about and you know i've been absorbing th throughout the, that time is is definitely working well and um success breeds success guys you know you know you guys know how it is like mm -hmm. once you can start moving the needle you know that's why i think that's why the success rates are so low you know it's the 80 20 rule guys 80 percent of the guys um, I mean, I'm sorry, 20% of the elk hunters kill 80% of the elk. Mm -hmm. It's just the top, the Lampers, the Sam Davises. I mean, you've killed three out of four. That's pretty daggum good. You got a few guys that are at the top of the food chain, and then everybody else is struggling for this 5% realm. So these are the things, the things we're talking about right now and that we're going to be talking about through this whole series are all things that all of these guys are doing to move that needle. Now, they may not call it four hunt areas. They may not call it zones of pressure. They may not call it establishing a hunt parameter. But I can guarantee you that these top-level dudes are, 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 are going through a process that's very similar to this. And they don't even, some of them, like Ryan Lampers, doesn't even know why he does it. He just has been doing it for so long. He's had so much experience. He just knows, well, that spot's got elk. That's There's going to be elk right there. It's just he can look at it, and he, and he doesn't realize that subliminally he's processing that whole environment, that whole landscape, and he's making a determination based on experience, knowledge, all this stuff. And it just it just makes sense to him. He's like, well, there that's that's obvious. That's the spot. But a newer hunter would look at it and be like, well, I don't know why that spot's any better than this spot over here. Because mm -hmm. they got nothing to base it on. They got no past experience to apply to it. And that's where I hope this course is going to set, you know, um, differentiate some of these hunters from, from others is that it's going to give you a strategy and the tools to work through the process. And maybe you'll use some, maybe you'll use all of them, you know, Maybe you'll use very few of them, but the ones that you do use and the ones that you do apply will move the needle guaranteed will move the needle. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, you're going to you absorb know. all this stuff. And like, like you said, I mean, every place is different. Every hunter is different. How everybody hunts is different. And I mean, you're going to find ways that you're going to apply these specific things to your application and, but they will become successful. And you, like subconsciously, you might not even know you're doing them, but you're just doing them. That's right. And, and guys, maps you know i can't stress this enough the more you do it the more the better you get at it right like anything and if you know i'm pretty freaking good with technology and mapping and tools that's that's my string because i'm from the midwest i was traveling to hunt elk for the first 27 years i never not one trip boots on the ground scouted western mm -hmm. elk never every single place i went to was all digital and still to this day even living in montana i rarely i talk about this a lot but i rarely put boots on the ground i just don't think it's that valuable now a lot of guys do and i think it's to each their own 
But where elk are in June, where they are in May, where they are in, is not where they're going to necessarily be in September. And now there's things you can do when you're finding old rub lines in June. That gives you some idea where the rutting areas are. I get it. And everyone said, you know, you read a lot of research about where the calving areas are. Is a lot of times where the rut zones end up being. I, I get all that too. But I, I, I will go out on a limb and say, if you're going to spend a full weekend boots on the ground scouting, you're going to drive to spot A, three or four hours, five hours, ten, whatever it is. And then you're going to spend the whole weekend hiking around. Maybe you might cover 20 miles. Maybe you might cover 25. If you took the same amount of time, all the time that you're there, and you spent it in your applications and aerial photos and analyzing view sheds and, and 3D analysis and flyover tours and zones of pressure, and now you spent all that time doing that, you are way, 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 further down the road than you ever will be boots on the ground. Yeah. You can't, you can't cover the territory. You can't see everything you want to see. And now it, it, there's nothing wrong with it. If you've got the time and you've got the resources to do it by all means, uh, knowing terrain and it, being able to be in there and, and get some, get a feel for it um, is never a waste of time. Don't get me wrong on this. I'm just saying if I had to spend X amount of hours and that's all I had, I would rather spend it looking at big giant zones and breaking them down than I would drive into one particular trailhead in the middle of XYZ unit and hiking around for three days. Does that make sense? Or am I, yeah, is that, yeah, it does, buddy. Well, the thing about it, I just want to quickly add is like time is the biggest currency for everybody as we get older, right? We've got very busy lights. The nice thing about like um, Treeline Academy is, you can plug away at it if you start now. Like if you go in, buy the pro, uh, get the program now, and we got a uh, promo focus twenty two promo code will give you a bit of a discount. Um, you go in and you buy it now, and you just start chipping away at these things every night. You put the kids to bed. You come down. You got half an hour mm -hmm. before you go to bed. You go, you know, you go through a couple of the modules and you go through them, right? And you just slowly chip away at it. That way, you know by you know, you still have lots of time where you can go back and look at stuff you didn't understand and you can kind of slowly put it together over time. Whereas, like you said, you do it in August and then it's quickly you're scanning through because now you don't have time and you realize you want to go hunting, but you know, you're not really absorbing all the stuff you would if you would have taken the time and gone through the process in the way it's designed to go through. And talk about the confidence. I know for myself personally, getting through the course, identifying uh core hunting areas you got plan a plan b plan c you have all these plans but then you have separate plans in like in alberta our zones are a little bit smaller you've already identified a completely new area so like you're saying like maybe maybe you had some past success it's too easy to get stuck into a rut now i know exactly where i'm going and if i've gone that hunt plan i'm not returning to that area if i don't find elk I can up and move if I have to, because if there's no bugling, no rut action, I can go to a completely other zone and you have that confidence, that security blanket that I've already vetted all that. I know where I'm going to go. I'm not going to get stuck in a rut because I know for myself, that's what this program helped me get out of was getting in ruts where you're just pounding an area over and over again, when really you should have had a plan for a completely new area and just moved. Man, you, the oh you that was perfect probably the number one comment i get from hunters after the season is man i spent too much time in an area that didn't have elk yeah i spent too much and i so let me give you the scenario you guys are probably gonna laugh when i tell you this. so here's your scenario you're seven days into you're you're on a seven ten day hunt you're day five it's just not working out. You're not, you're not running into elk. You're not encountering elk. You're not hearing elk bugles. You're like, you got, okay, here's your mind. Okay. I got five days. Uh, do I have time to make a move? Do I, mm -hmm. I mean, am I really going to, is it really going to be productive and what? Well, if you work it out the way I, the way that I propose that you work it out, you already know how long it's going to take you to drive over there. You know how long it's going to take you to hike into your camp. You know exactly where you're going to camp. You know where your first five glassing spots are going to be. You've already got them labeled. You know how long it's going to take you to hike to that glassing spot. Exactly. So think about that. So now it's it's noon. 
and you're on day five and the morning was terrible, you're ready to make a move. Well, you pull out your hunt plan. You're like, okay, in three hours, I can be to this trail on this new hunt area. It's going to take me two hours to hike in. I can be there before dark. And then if I set my alarm at three in the morning, four in the morning, I could be at that glassing spot by first light. Guys, that scenario makes you excited to yeah. move, right? But when you don't have that and you're sitting there like, well, I guess I could go over there. I don't, and just hopefully I'll hear something. And I, maybe I, I don't even know where I'm going to guys. What if you have to hike into the dark? What if you have to try to pick a campsite in the dark, right? No, you're going to be likely. Now I'm not saying everybody, but you're going to tend to be more likely to not do it. But when you have it all worked out to the nth detail, like I just told you, and the way that's actually coming up in the next three modules here is developing a strategic hunt plan. Guys, that template that I have in this course is the exact template that I use every single year. Now, I tweak it and modify it and whatever, but that template is, uh, and I just updated it again with a few other things that were helpful for people, I think. So I just updated it a couple months ago. But anyway, that template goes to the level that we just talked about. How much, how long is it going to take me to drive there? How far is my pack in? Where am I going to camp? Where's my first bugling spots or my glassing spots or whatever your strategy is going to be? I'm telling you guys are nine times more likely to pack up and move to an area and find elk than just be like, well, I got four days left. I'm just going to grind it out here. And let alone if you have reception to even download the maps that you need. That's right. So, oh, that's the thing. How many guys have I seen pulled over on the side of the road and I pull up, I'm like, what's, what's up boys? Well, I'm trying to download some new maps for this new <laughs> yeah. area I'm going to. I'm like, yeah. well, uh, guys, I drove one time. I, I hate to admit this. Um, I made a I mistake. Think everybody, everybody's done that. I oh, made yeah. a mistake. <laughs> I had three or four hunt areas and we had a snowstorm that was just monumental in September. We got 18 inches of snow and I'm like, Holy crap, we got to change elevations. Well, I did not have, you know, I talk about, if you guys heard me on having those three to five hunt areas, one of them or two of them needs to be a radical change in elevation for a lot of reasons. But, and this is a good example, we had to get out of the snow. Not, not that the elk weren't there, but we couldn't hike in it. We couldn't drive in it. We couldn't get where we wanted to go. So it was a limiter, not because maybe we weren't running into elk or that the elk were moved, is because we were limited by being able to access it. Mm -hmm. And so I had to drive five hours into Dillon, Montana. I'm even going to tell you where it's at. I had to drive into Dillon, Montana and download <laughs> some new maps. And I'll, I'm just going to say it. We didn't kill any elk. And because we we were working on our hunt plan in the middle of the freaking hunt yeah and it was a, it was a mess it was a real mess and i learned my lesson and ever since then um i don't make that mistake <laughs> mm -hmm. one of those hard lessons we all have it's to a hard one oh yeah and, uh, it's never a good feeling okay, okay beauty. so let's keep rolling through these uh, yeah. modules here so the zones of pressure is the next one. Okay. We've talked about core hunting areas. There's a lot there. We just kind of scratched the surface. And so zones of pressure, this is an area where I feel like most elk hunters do not spend enough time at this area because there is a lot here and it's very, this is the one where guys, the most, this is the one module where people come to me and say, you know, I didn't really grasp what you were saying the first time. I didn't really get it. When you say zones of pressure, I'm like, I, I know what you mean. I mean, where are the hunters going to park and where they, I, I, I get what you're saying. Well, not really. So what you're looking at here is not only is where the pressure is going to come from, where it's likely to come from and how much pressure is there. Well, how do you know all that? I mean, how would you how would you know that in a spot that you've never been to? You've never gone there before ever. How are you going to make any kind of reasonable determinations for that? Well, we go through that in this module. And there's a lot of things you guys can do. A lot. You can zoom in on every single trailhead. 
and look at the and you have to do it in Google Earth Pro, guys. This is the key. You can't do it in on X. You can't do it in Go Hunt. You can't do it in anything else because of two reasons. One, the image quality is not good enough for this level of detail. Number two, you don't have the dates of the imagery, accurate dates of the imagery. Now, Go Hunt has some historical data now, but still doesn't have the breadth of historical data that's available in Google Earth Pro. So, for example, you zoom in on Trailhead A. You're looking at it, and you're paging through the years of aerial photos in Google Earth, right? Well, you look at June. Well, there's a whole bunch of cars there in June. There's a whole bunch of cars there in July. You get to September, and there's, like, almost no cars there. And, like, okay, that's interesting. October, no cars. November, bunch of cars. I'm, like, okay, maybe there's a lot of late season. Maybe this is a late season. So, guys, there there's no magic formula here, but looking at these trailheads or these access points or dead end roads, all these so-called takeoff points, when you zoom in on them, you can see how many cars are there, what dates the cars are there, and more importantly, what types of cars are there. Is it a mm -hmm. car? Is it a truck? Is it a horse trailer? Mm -hmm. Is it Mark Livesey's llama trailer? Um, you know, these are things that start to paint the picture, right? There's horses there. There's four yeah. horse trailers there, September 15th. I'm like, okay, does that mean we're not going there? No, that does not mean that. It, but it, it's painting us a picture. It's like, okay, there's obviously some type of outfitter or individual. And how do we know if it's outfitter traffic? Well, here's a telltale sign. When you see a horse trailer hooked onto a truck and you see three pickups parked right beside it or three cars, parked right beside it that's a very very good indication of an outfitter because you got clients that are parked beside the outfitter mm -hmm. when you see a truck and a and a horse trailer by itself now guys this isn't rules i'm just saying that's more than likely an individual mm -hmm. that's i'm in there and is hunting on horseback does that make sense these are just yeah. guys these oh, are yeah, so obvious sure. and they seem so well, simplistic it's, thing, it's it's stuff too that nobody thinks about. Like I didn't, I never That's thought right. about that. Right. But you do have like, there's nothing more frustrating than planning a trip going into an area where you have like, like an LEH, just, you just got an LEH, you plan your hunt, you go into this one specific area, you say, okay, I'm going to get access this way. And you go in there and you realize that an outfitter's in there with three clients at the same time. Nothing that there's anything wrong with outfitters being in there. It's there, right? I mean, there's lots of land to cover, but still it's like, oh, are you kidding me? Very frustrating. So, like, those are things definitely to think about. And, like, what we talked about, uh, not the last time you were on, but the time before, is, like, accessing historical data in Google is really is really good, too. And I never knew anything about that as well. Because most people don't really – it's a very obscure button at the top. And it's just not obvious. And let's just be honest. I'm going to talk about this tonight on this webinar. Believe it or not, Google Earth was not built for hunters. <laughs> And as much as we'd they, like to they think didn't it was made it. They, for us. They, didn't put, they didn't put the buttons in that said, you know, <laughs> find the best glassing spot, press here. Um, and so, again, we're using a tool that wasn't designed for hunting, but it's perfect for hunting. We just got to learn how to manipulate it, adapt it, and more importantly, how to set it up with the right preferences and settings, right? And that's all covered in this course that's coming up at a module we're getting to here. But um, so zones of pressure, okay. We talked about trailhead analysis. One of the last things I don't want to give away all of the trip to here, but no, no, man, one of the other sure. things that we guys do not trust your hunting apps for motor vehicle and uh, motor vehicle, motor vehicle accessible roads. Now, are they accurate most of the time? Yes, they are. Some are better than others. But I am a, if you guys have listened to me very long, you're going to learn really quick that I am a master of multiple, multiple tools. And I think it's incredibly valuable that you learn how to use multiple tools, not just one. You know, I know guys that have the Onyx tattoo and they're like, man, I, I, I bleed red. I, I got default red waypoint icon tattooed on my shoulder. I'm like, okay. Um, I'm good with that. Um, Looks like we got somebody else trying to join us here, but mm -hmm. um, uh, 